In this video we're going to talk about logging, log4j, and how to set up log4j with Maven in an Eclipse dynamic web project. Logging is very important to consider throughout the entire development life cycle. We only realize how important it is once our application is rolled out and in production, and especially when we start getting errors with it. When we start getting errors we have to play CSI sometimes, and we have to go back and investigate try to replay what happened. The only way we can do that is if we have enough information to tell us what happened. And logging is how we get that information. Now log4j is something that's been fairly standard within Java programming for quite a long time. There aren't, honestly, to my knowledge, there aren't many competitors to it. It's just everybody uses log4j. It is industry standard, free, reliable, uh, very frequently used easy to configure with log4j properties if you know what you're looking for. Now with log4j properties we're typically going to define a few things. First of all, not all log messages are created equally. There are different severities of log levels and we have to ask ourselves the question, what do we want? Too much information in the logs or too little? or maybe something in between, hopefully something in between. So we have different logging levels we're going to take a look at on the next slide. An appender is something that uh, publishes logging information. Now we typically think of logs going to something like a file, but it could also go to an email or a server somewhere via a message. It could go to an error window, a console. It could go to several places. The same log can go to several places. So the appender is what publishes it to these places. Now we also have a logger. A logger is what uh, essentially collects logging information and provides it to an appender. Where does it collect the logging information? Well, it collects it from the source code. And multiple appenders can be subscribed to the same log. The root logger is considered kind of like the default logger for the entire application. Now, both loggers and appenders can have logging levels set. The logging levels look like this. At the very top, we're going to have fatal. That basically means that our application is going to die. Uh, error is next. You're going to, as you see, there will be more of these as we go down. In other words, we're going to see a whole lot of debugs, not so many fatals, hopefully. So, uh, fatal uh, is, is one hopefully we won't see too frequently. Error, that's something we would probably log in a catch block. Info, uh, maybe we'll want to make note of something like, well, the species is empty. Are you sure you want the species to be empty? Warn, uh, a little more granular than info. And then finally, debug would be something like, we're entering a method, we're exiting a method. So you see we get more verbose as we go down. Okay. Now we're going to configure these things with a log4j properties file, which we'll look at here in just a moment uh, in our virtual machine. I have pre-copied a few things we're going to need in the notepad here. First of all, we're using Maven and in this project, and so what we need to do to grab log4j is simply add this dependency here. Now, don't worry about copying that directly from this video uh, because I will commit this information to uh, GitHub and so you can just grab it from there. But I'm going to go to the bottom of my uh, palm, which is now getting longer and longer. I'm going to put in this dependency, Control shift f and uh, we will let it uh, realign just a moment there. There we go, and save. Okay, next thing is we need a log4j file, a log4j properties file. We can either do XML, that's actually the preferred method, or we can do a traditional properties uh, name, uh, name equals value file like we see here. I'm going to do the properties file, honestly, for a strange reason. Because the XML file is pretty easy to read. And you can pick that one up fairly quickly. The properties file, which I see just about as many properties files as I do XML files. The property file is a bit harder to understand, and so I want to show it here just so I can explain it, so that way you can choose whichever you want when you implement this, either the properties file or the um, XML file. So first of all, I'm going to copy this information and right-click on source, and I'm going to say new file, and just other file will be fine. 
and then we're just going to say general old file and then uh, watch my capitalization here log4j dot properties so it should be spelled just like this because this is a magic file that it's looking for and now I'm going to paste my default information now one thing we've put this in our source tree that's kind of considered a little bit dirty to put a properties file there it's okay it will work it's just kind of considered dirty incidentally this is the default place where it's looking for a log4j file if you don't like putting it there that's okay what you can do is you can use this flag that I've highlighted here which is dash d log4j.configuration equals and then after the equal sign put a path to where the log4j properties is. If you're running this in a web application, particularly within Eclipse, double click the, go to the J2E eView, Servers tab, Tomcat V8, Open Launch Configuration, Arguments. And then this is where you put any JVM arguments. Notice they all start with dash G, dash D rather, uh, just like the one that I showed you that starts with a dash D. So that's where we would put that. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and leave it at the default. We're going to leave it right here. Okay, deep breath. What are we looking at here? Okay, the logger, remember this is the one that's gathering the logging information uh, from our running application. And this is the root logger, the default logger. What's confusing here is we have a comma separated list. And the items on this list are not the same. The first item is that logging level. Remember what our logging levels are from the presentation, fatal error, info, warn, and debug. So what this means is we're going to produce errors only that are info level or higher, and we are going to uh, publish them where? That's where this list gets a little bit confusing. After the first element, we have a comma, and then we have another element called file. This is a list of appenders, and I can have more than one appender. So I might say file, and then I might say priority file, or something like that, or something like that. Each thing that follows after this logging level is the appender, or are the appenders that are subscribed to this logger. Does that make sense yet? Don't worry if it doesn't. I realize it's a bit confusing. How do we know what this file appender is? Well, we have to look for a very specific syntax. In log4j, an appender starts with log4j.appender, and then finally, the appender name. So file here matches to file here, 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 here. What we're saying is that in this area, we're defining an appender, and its name is file. We're subscribing this appender to this root logger. In other words, root logger gathers logging information, gives it to the appender, the appender prints that logging information, in this case to a file. And my apologies if I was a bit redundant in that explanation, but it took me a good long time to understand this myself the first time I looked at it. It was one of those things where I always knew which property to change, but I never understood that line number two, and that line never made sense to me. Okay, until I went through that explanation. So this file appender, what we're saying is what type is it? Well, it's a rolling file appender. It's going to send logging information to this file. Once that file gets 10 megabytes in size, it's going to roll it over. What that means is it's going to back it up and create a new file. We're going to allow 10 backups. After the 10th, it's going to start deleting files that are old. Okay, So it will back up the current file to a, like a number 1, back up number 1 to number 2, number 2 to number 3, all the way up until we get to number 9, 9 backs up to 10, the old 10 becomes deleted. So the oldest backup file always gets deleted. Okay, And now what's the pattern going to look like? How is it going to look when we print information to this log? So that's the information we need to set up a logger and an appender. The next thing we need to do is implement this in our code. So I'm going to navigate to our UI layer and let's take a look at some things that we can do. I'm going to go to add plant. Okay. And control M so we can see this in high definition. Okay. Uh, one thing I need to do is I need to say final static logger logger equals logger. And just a moment. 
git logger. There we go. Okay, and then the name of the current class, which is add plant dot class. Okay. Uh, control shift O, make sure we have imports organized. It looks like we're good there. Okay. Now, when we log, we're going to log to this logger right here. Remember the logger? Logger and appender. Logger is the thing that is assembling or gathering log messages from our code. Okay, so what I might do when I go into this execute method is I might say logger, whoops, spelled correctly, and then we might say info, okay, and message, and we'll simply say entering the execute method. So you see that's something that's going to go into the log very frequently because it's information, it's info level. It's not fatal or anything, it's just info, okay? Remember, if you've seen a previous video, we have a method here that's trying to save a plant. If something goes wrong, it's going to skip everything until it gets to the catch block. So as soon as we get to the line immediately after the method save, and as long as it's before that catch block, we know that the save was successful. So I might say logger.info, and then I might say save successful. And then I might even go as far to say uh, plus plant dot two string. Now, uh, careful about this. If you're dealing with financial information, if you're dealing with financial transactions, things like that, don't put sensitive information uh, into a log file, credit card number or uh, passwords, anything like that. So if you are doing one of these where you're logging some information that was saved, uh, make sure it's not sensitive information. Okay. So now we have two at info level, exceptions. Make sure you're putting logs in exceptions. That's a major code review item. Make sure that you're doing it before you submit your project for code review. Uh, if you're code reviewing, make sure that exceptions have log messages. So I'm going to say logger. Dot, uh, this time we're going to say error. Okay. And we'll say error while saving plant message. Okay. And then we'll say plus E dot get message. Okay. This is crucial. Uh, all of your exceptions should have these because when you're trying to debug something later in life, uh, once, your, once your software is rolled out, you live and die by these messages. Let's go ahead and jump to the save method here. Um, nothing major in the save method. I think this is just a pass through. We could do another log info here, uh, or we could run on down to the insert method. We could do another log in this DAO. Uh, you know, probably a good idea to spread this logging information out throughout our application. As a matter of fact, since this is a stub, it's a good idea to put a log message to just say, hey, the stub is wired up. Uh, that way, somebody realizes they're not actually saving anything, it's just going to the stub. Uh, I've honestly known that to happen before where someone was having a problem in production, and what happened is that a stub was put in place, not the actual production class. It took a long time to get to the bottom of that. So we'll say static final logger. This time we'll just call it log equals logger dot get logger. Okay, and then class here is going to be plant DAO stub dot class okay uh, lowercase the l and terminate with the semicolon and save okay now we'll simply log down here in the insert we'll say log dot we could do an info or maybe a warn here uh, honestly i kind of think warn is more uh, let's see if we can do it let's do a warn here what the heck okay log dot warn and we're going to say inserting to stub Semicolon. Whoops. This does not persist the item. Like so. And save. Okay. Now we're in good shape. So I'm simply going to rebuild, deploy, and then we're going to take a look at our logs. Okay. I have deployed. Uh, let's go ahead. I'm going to say genus foo and submit. This one should execute successfully. I forgot I have the breakpoint uh, debugger on, so I'm going to turn off breakpoints and resume. And sure enough, we see our growl is popping up. We'll allow that to go away. 
and the growl I did in a previous video. Okay, now let me take away genus, and we know this is going to cause an error. I take away genus, I hit submit, we get our error growl. Okay, and let's go look for the error file. So remember, we were we configured this in log4j.properties, and it's storing the log in C log logging.log. Okay, let's take a look. So C log logging. And uh, September 21st, 2015 at uh, 1031 p.m. That's right about the current time. And so I'm going to go in here and you'll see that log4j is a standard thing. And so we have uh, logging information from other things that our application is using. If I scroll down a bit, we're going to see error. Error while saving plant message genus required. Okay, uh, then we see info. Th th remember, I, I tried it a couple different times. So we see an info here. We see the class name that's doing the logging. Remember when we set up our logger, we gave it the class name. The line number where this log happened, we have entering the execute method. Okay, now this is the time that I actually put in foo. Inserting into the stub, this does not persist the item. Notice that the logging level there is worn. Okay, then we have save successful. Okay, now we have entering the execute method, which is our info, and then error will saving plant. And by the way, this error up here, I paused the video and I just tr uh, trialed what I was about to demonstrate, make sure it went okay. So that one you didn't see in the video. Uh, the ones that you would have seen in the video is this block, this last five right here. So the first one was successful. We see it warns us about the stub, and then it says save successful. The next one is where I deleted some information and uh, made an invalid save. So it tells us we're entering the execute method. Okay, remember what that is. If I go back to add plant, just a moment. Okay, remember that's this very first line here, log info entering the execute method. And then after that, uh, we got an exception or an error. It said error while saving plant. So let's go back and take a look. Error while saving plant, message genus required. So see some very helpful information. It's going to be very good for us uh, when we are actually rolling our application out. Now we also see a fair bit of clutter uh, because we see that there are things like um, you know, other messages here. There's a lot of info. What I typically recommend if you have an error, go to the log file, go to the bottom, search for error, direction up. You want to go to the bottom because the most recent logging information will be at the bottom. Okay, And you see that allows you to select only the messages that were logged at error. Logging is very important. The log level is important. Don't log everything at info. Don't log everything at error. Make sure things that are legitimately errors are legitimately errors, and things that are info are info. Okay, now remember we can subscribe multiple appenders to one logger, and that can help us to kind of reduce the amount of clutter that we have. So let's try that out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new appender, and to make a new appender, all I have to do is duplicate this information from my existing appender, and then simply change the name. Uh, so let's say uh, logger appender. Let's just call this one error file because maybe we'll only show errors in it. So I'm going to replace each thing here with error file. Okay. You see that just by changing that third argument, I'm creating and defining the properties for a new appender. Okay. And now what we're going to do is we're going to say we're going to add a new argument called threshold and we're going to say equals error. Now one other thing, let's not forget to change the file where this is going to send its log. So I'm going to change the file to errorlogging.log. So you see I have two different files. One that's only showing errors, and one that's showing everything that the logger is, the, uh, uh, logger is, is giving us. So one is more restrictive than the other. And here again, 
rolling file appender isn't the only option. Uh, we certainly could send a text message or send an email. There are lots of other things that we can do with logging to escalate these logs. So I'm going to uh, simply save and restart the server and after that we'll try it out and we'll see what it looks like. Just a moment. Okay, and the application has redeployed so I'm going to go to the add a plant screen. And we'll do one just normal plant and then one that we're going to make uh, with an error. So we'll go ahead. Of course, this is actually just going to the stub. It's not actually persisting. But here's our success. We see plant saved. We'll give that growl a moment to dismiss. And then we will try again with an empty genus, which should give us an error. And sure enough, the growl confirms that we have an error. So let's take a look at the error logs. Notice we have our existing log. Uh, no surprise here. We have info, warn, and error, a fairly verbose log. This includes the log messages that we had before we changed the logging information and restarted, and it includes the log information from after uh, making that change. So you see this spans several restarts of the application server. Now take a look. You see error logging. Notice it's significantly smaller than logging. Click into this, and we only have the error message. So you see that log4j properties, we can use that to filter not only the logs that are getting produced, but also the level at which our appenders are appending log information to a file, to a database, uh, to an escalation service, or whatever it is. As a matter of fact, if I went ahead and, and erred one more time, uh, we'll see that we now have two errors, okay? Uh, same information this time, a little bit different apart. You see the date here, the time, the logging level, the class, the line number where it occurred, and then the message. So logging, one of our best friends, especially when we've rolled out and we've rolled into support, this is something that we do not want to neglect early. We want to make sure that we're thorough with our logging in every step of development because when we do go to roll this out, those logging messages are going to be very important. Thank you.